episode 78. This show is entitled, With a Little Help from My Friends. But first up today, an article from the www.mentalfloss.com website, written by Jessica Heinger. Seven Absolutely Insane Animal Defence Mechanisms. In 2012, scientists recorded footage of a never-before-seen defence mechanism, deployed by a small species of deep-sea squid. When threatened, the squid attacks its predator and then pulls away, breaking off the tip of its own arm and leaving it behind as a distraction. The arm continues to glow and twitch, creating a diversion and enabling the squid to escape. But this squid isn't the only creature with a bizarre way of defending itself. Here are several other ways animals try to save their own lives or the lives of their comrades. Number one, the lizard that shoots blood from its eyes. The Texas horned lizard is a scary looking creature brown, plump and perfectly camouflaged in its native sandy environment. Its first line of defence is its spiky demeanour. If the sharp spikes and horns don't warn off predators, the lizard steps up a notch and squirts a well-aimed stream of blood out of its eyes. The stream of blood, which can go as far as five feet, is mixed with a foul-tasting chemical that wards off predators. But this odd weapon comes at a cost. The lizard may release a third of its total blood supply this way, amounting to 2% of its body mass. Number 2. The hairy frog that breaks its own bones. What if every time you felt threatened, your first and only method of defence was to break your own bones and use them for weapons? Meet the hairy frog, a central African species that, despite its name and fuzzy appearance, isn't hairy at all. When breeding, the male frogs develop thin strands of skin along the sides of their bodies that resemble hair. These strands also, in theory, allow the frogs to take in more oxygen while they watch over their eggs. But what's really compelling about this frog is its ability to crack its own toe bones and push them through their skin to form sharp claws, great for warding off would-be attackers. While it's not completely clear what happens to the bones after the threat of attack subsides, researchers believe that the bones slide back under the skin when the frog's muscles relax. Number three the newt that turns its ribs into spikes. The hairy frog isn't the only amphibian that uses its bones for weapons. When attacked, the Spanish ribbed newt shifts its ribs forward at an angle and pushes them through its stretched skin. The resulting effect is a row of spikes on either side of its body. Like the hairy frog, the newt has to force the bones through its skin every time it is attacked but the mechanism seems to cause little or no harm to the creature. Newts and amphibians in general are known to have an extraordinary ability to repair their skin, says zoologist Egan Heiss of the University of Vienna in Austria. Number four, the termites that blow themselves up. Talk about taking one for the team. When under attack, a species of termites found in the French Guiana rainforests sends older worker bugs on suicide missions to defend the whole colony. These older bugs, no longer as useful to the pack as they once were, come equipped with explosive backpacks that over a lifetime fill with toxic crystals produced by glands in the abdomen. When mixed with salivary gland secretions, these crystals create a toxic liquid that explodes on enemies, paralysing them and killing the worker at the same time. 
Number five, the hagfish that slimes its enemies. Hagfish are eel-shaped marine animals with the incredibly useful ability to slime their enemies. When threatened, the hagfish emit a slime from their pores that when mixed with water expands into a gelatinous goo that can either trap predators or suffocate them by clogging their gills. The video above shows hagfish being attacked 14 separate times by sharks and other big fish and coming out completely unharmed. Each predator took one bite before immediately spitting the hagfish out and swimming away, gagging. The hagfish, uninjured and oblivious, just carried on feeding. Its defence is so effective that it can totally ignore the fact that a shark just tried to bite it, says Discover magazine. Number 6. The sea cucumber that shoots organs out of its anus. Sea cucumbers can seem pretty boring. There are some 1,250 known species of these sedentary creatures in the world, and many of them do indeed look like cucumbers. But when it comes to survival, things get interesting. Like starfish and sea urchins, sea cucumbers are echinoderms, and they can regenerate lost body parts if necessary. This comes in handy when they're threatened. The sea cucumber will expel their internal organs, which are sticky and sometimes contain a toxic chemical that can kill predators. And finally, number seven, the opossum that plays, well, you know. You can't do a roundup like this without at least mentioning the opossum. We typically refer to this creature's infamous defence mechanism as playing dead. But there's actually nothing playful about it. The act is completely involuntary. Under intense fear, opossums fall into a comatose-like state that can last for hours. Long enough to convince any predator that the opossum is already dead. Also unappetising, fear causes these animals to emit a corpse-like smell that only adds to their act. The first episode of the Mysteries Abound podcast went for 28 minutes and 24 seconds and was uploaded to the internet on the 1st of July 2008. The very first podcast I ever produced was episode 1 of the Bizarre Bizarre podcast and that was on the 2nd of December 2007. The first Mysteries Abound podcast had a listening audience of just two. From the citypaper.net website, an article by Ryan Briggs. Our Lady of Fairmont Park. 60 years ago this week, the Virgin Mary visited West Philadelphia and in one of the more bizarre chapters in the city's ecclesiastical history, so did 70,000 pilgrims. The epicentre of the religious frenzy? An unremarkable, if oddly placed, privet bush in Fairmont Park near 51st Street and Parkside Avenue. This shrub's unlikely turn into the spotlight began on the afternoon of September 18, 1953. A sunny and hot one according to the farmer's almanac. Three girls were walking home from class at St Gregory's Roman Catholic Parochial School located near 52nd Street and Lancaster Avenue. Tracing the perimeter of Fairmont Park, Margaret Kevill, Mary Haggerty and Roseanne Pinto, all 14 at the time, stopped to chat on a bench. There, in the privet bush, the three saw a vision of Christ's mother in a blue veil and white gown. Or so they said. They returned the next day with friends, sisters Mary and Carol Burns, 
who this time kneeling before the miraculous bush, also claimed to see a face amid the tangle of branches, according to a Life magazine article from the time. All claimed to detect an inexplicable breeze and the scent of roses emanating from the plant. But church officials dismissed the apparition as a mass hallucination, while others said a recently released movie about Portuguese children witnessing a Marian apparition had fueled overexcited imaginations. Not that it really mattered. Word spread that the bush had healing properties, and a rumour purported that the Virgin Mary would appear again on the evening of October 25. Over the next month, a trickle of gawkers from the surrounding Parkside neighbourhood turned into a deluge of worshippers as more residents of Philadelphia's Catholic wards came to inspect the mysterious plant, just in case. When the night of October 25 finally rolled around, 50,000 people had assembled for an encore performance from the apparition, according to newspaper accounts. By this time, 20,000 visitors had already passed by the bush, now festooned with rosaries, prayer cards and lots of money. About $53,667 worth, adjusted for inflation. The now disbanded Fairmont Park Guard erected in and out signs to direct the flow of visitors, and six guardsmen stood in formation around the shrub. Visitors claimed that they could already see the outline of the Virgin in tree branches above the bush. One man kneeled over and died in anticipation, according to a story in the Philadelphia Evening Bulletin. Perhaps it goes without saying that Mary never showed up that night, but the cash left by the plant was collected by park guards and a court case ensued. Eventually the court decided that a shelter and benches should be constructed with the money in order to accommodate future onlookers. But despite the construction of a handsome stone gazebo and picnic tables, the crowds dried up within a month. Still, park planning maps marked the Vision Bush up to at least 1983. Amazingly, that wasn't the first time the Virgin Mary was spotted in West Philly, in 1881, the New York Times reported that an 18-year-old blind girl had claimed to have seen Mary on the wall of her bedroom at 4058 Market Street. Others also witnessed a crowned figure on the wall, though the reporter was warned by a doctor that the girl is in a state of diphtheria and is liable to imagine anything. But today, 60 years after the sighting in Fairmont Park, a lot has changed. Parkside's Catholic community has scattered and St Gregory's is gone. It closed long ago and the building was destroyed by a fire in 2012. The girls left the neighbourhood decades ago. The bench they sat on is gone and evening bulletin reporter Henry Darling, who broke the story, died last year. But the privet bush improbably is still there. And so is Mary. Someone has erected a massive wooden cross in front of the bush and tied a plastic lawn ornament of the Virgin to the crucifix with a piece of wire. Hand carved into the cross is an inscription. At this bush on 9-18-53, Mary, our Blessed Mother, appeared. The gazebo still stands, but someone has scrawled a lewd message on its side. Six decades haven't put an end to visitors either, at least not completely. Now in the shadow of the man centre, two individuals crouched before the vision bush on a recent afternoon with a cat carrier in tow. Winfield resident Charmond Lane with his girlfriend Kimberly said they like to bring their cat to the spot to let her run around. It makes you think, said Lane. I was born in 1953 myself and I sort of identify with this because my mother's name was Mary Magdalene. I'm her only son and I was raised in the church. And I do have visions, he said. 
Lane first related a fairly literal vision to help the city's troubled school system. But later he said that at times he thought he had seen more miraculous things, like the girls said they did 60 years ago. Even so, he said, I don't believe in this statue and all that. I believe in God being spiritual rather than physical. That there is just an idol. Marco Polo heard their mournful moans in China. Charles Darwin wrote about a sandy hill that the Chileans called the Bellowa. And George Curzon, the Viceroy of India, described how they sounded like a rumble of distant thunder. In the century since Curzon listed 33 examples of singing sand dunes, we have only found a handful more. Indeed, out of the millions of dunes in the world's deserts, only 40 emit this earth-shaking baritone boom when stroked by winds or provoked by feet. The mystery surrounding the phenomenon is a perfect example of how science has become very good at dealing with the subatomic or with the grandest expanses of the universe, but often falls down when it comes to the messy bit in between. What we call the mesoscale, covering everything from how our brains work to how bees manage to fly, about which aerodynamicists argued for decades. Now, the most detailed account yet of how the dunes create their distinctive sounds has been outlined by Dr. Nathalie Friend of Cambridge University after years of work in the Californian desert with colleagues at the state's Institute of Technology, Caltech. She explains that the booms, which can be heard up to two miles away, actually start with a belch. If you run your hand through the sand, you can hear it, she says. The faster you do it, the higher the pitch. A French team has performed elegant experiments on sand in the laboratory, showing how the pitch and volume rise as a paddle passes through more quickly. Climb to the top of the dune and slide down the steeper slip face, and you get a gut-shaking drone, like a massed Gregorian chant. I always tell people what to expect their first time, says Dr. Verind. But when the entire dune and their body starts to shake, they always cry out, Oh my gosh! The reason that sand is able to generate such sound is down to a feature beneath the surface of the dune, which enables it to harness and reflect the tiny noises released by the tumbling grains. When we stuck a probe into a singing dune, we found a concrete hard layer at a depth of about one and a half to two metres, says Dr. Verend. The grains clumped to form conglomerates held together by calcium carbonate, either as a result of rainwater percolating down or salty groundwater drawn upwards. When they used ground penetrating radar, her team found several such hard layers in parallel. These are laid down over the years as the dunes move, with grains blown up the windward side and then spilling over the slip face. 
When you trigger an avalanche, these wave guides cause the sound waves to interfere, to add together. The surface of the dune then amplifies the vibration. discovered a 19% improvement in a vital bit of heart tissue in patients with coronary artery disease when they listened to their favourite music. The idea that there's a vital connection between music and the heart is as old as the hills. From the heart, may it return to the heart, said Beethoven about his stupendous Missa Solemnis, which he thought was his greatest achievement. If you searched long enough, you could collect a thousand similar statements from musicians about the intended target of their music. We still use phrases like, that melody goes straight to the heart, a heartfelt performance, and probably always will. The ancients knew exactly why this was. The heart was the organ which heated the humours and sent them surging round the body making us angry if we were choleric or amorous if we were sanguine. Music worked on the mind and therefore on the humours. Heart, soul and music work together in a self-reinforcing loop. The brain, that cold wet matter as Aristotle called it, just didn't figure in the picture. No, it's the other way around. We don't believe the heart heats anything. We know that it's just a humble pump while the brain is the really sexy organ. It's billions of neurons pulsating with electrical impulses and apt to be sent into a frenzy by a surge of hormones. The brain is where music really makes its powerful effects felt. So let's rewrite Beethoven's sentence in the language of the physiologist. Let my surge of dopamine cause a similar surge in you. Hmm. Let's try a bit of neurology speak. Let high electrical activity in my hypothalamus, prompted by imagined musical patterns, cause similar activity in yours when you hear the same pattern. Is your heart set racing by those phrases? To use an obsolete phrase? I doubt it. At a more fundamental level, they're misleading because they play up to the prejudice that mind is the same as brain, and we can discuss our mental life as if human beings really are no different to a brain in a vat. I think music helps us to understand why this is such a suspect idea. We are not brains in vats. We are embodied creatures, and mind that is, the experience of being a living, feeling thing is surely spread out through that body. In any case,
the musical experience doesn't stop at the boundary of the individual person. Music is a social thing, connected to dancing and singing. It becomes most vividly alive in those moments when we do it, rather than passively witness it. Unfortunately, the study of musical perception has been captured by the huge prestige of the neurological sciences. We're surrounded by books with titles like Music and the Brain. This is your brain on music. Music cognition. What I'm waiting for is the book entitled Music and the Person, which pays attention to its effects on the whole human being, even the heart. This research proves to me, though perhaps not to Professor Deljanin, that the heart really is more than just a pump. It understands music and responds to it, just as the ancients said. Each Mysteries Abound podcast takes on average six hours to produce. That includes researching the stories, recording the voice track, picking the music, editing the voice track, uploading the podcast, creating the web page. All those things come together, they all take quite a lot of time. As an example, we are now up to section 68 of the audio track because I have to edit fix, remove, sort things out as I go along. It's not as smooth, as easy as it sounds. You don't just sit down and read a story from start to finish. Wish I could. The rare phenomenon is caused by the chemical makeup of the lake, but the petrified creatures it leaves behind are straight out of a horror film. Photographed by Nick Brandt in his new book, Across the Ravaged Land, petrified creatures pepper the area around the lake due to its constant pH of 9 to 10.5, an extremely basic alkalinity that preserves these creatures for eternity. According to Brandt, I unexpectedly found the creatures, all manner of birds and bats, washed up along the shoreline of Lake Natron in northern Tanzania. No one knows for certain exactly how they die, but it appears that the extreme reflective nature of the lake's surface confuses them, and like birds crashing into plate glass windows, they crash into the lake. The water has an extremely high soda and salt content, so high that it would strip the ink off my Kodak film boxes within a few seconds. The soda and salt causes the creatures to calcify, perfectly preserved as they dry. I took these creatures as I found them on the shoreline and then placed them in living positions, bringing them back to life, as it were, reanimated, alive again in death. The rest of the haunting images follow and they feature in Brandt's book. Or you could go and visit for yourself, but keep a safe distance from the water, please. And if you want to look at the photos, there's about six or seven of them, visit the show notes at www.origins.info, click on the link to the Mysteries Abound podcast, then on the link to episode 78 of the podcast show notes, and then on the link to this article. They're actually very spooky and beautifully photographed in black and white.
Did you ever look at the ancient pyramids in Egypt and think, why isn't there a gigantic carnival ride on top of those? Well, you wouldn't be alone because somebody asked that very question in 1931. From the paleofuture.gizmodo.com website, the 1931 plan to turn the pyramids into an amusement park. And this is written by Matt Novak. In a series of illustrations under the bold headline, Mammoth Flying Swing to Give Bird's Eye Pyramid View, we see the pyramids as they could have been. The main attraction in Giza's own version of Disneyland. Signed by Art Williamson in the June 1931 issue of Modern Mechanics and Invention magazine, the illustrations show three cars swirling around the top of a pyramid, driven by a huge electric motor. Judging from the pictures, it looks like would-be riders first had to get about two-thirds of the way up the pyramid. The thrill-seekers then were supposed to board the ride by crossing a gangplank. That gives me vertigo just looking at it. So why didn't this unbelievably irreverent idea come to pass? One suspects it might have had something to do with objections from the Egyptian government. The illustration mentions that when, not if, the government's consent is obtained, this amazing project will become a reality. But if you like a little hedonism to go along with your ancient history, don't worry, early 21st century Las Vegas has got you covered. And if you visit the show notes and click on the link to this article, you can see a few of the drawings that were suggested for the Pyramid Amusement Park. Quite interesting, quite crass. Luckily, they didn't come to fruition. And finally, from this set of short stories, an article from the mentalfloss.com website, written by Matt Soniak. And for those of you who are a fan of the show which has just finished called Breaking Bad, just like me, what is ricin? What is it, and where does it come from? Like some other scary poisons, ricin is naturally occurring. It's a protein found in Ricinus communis, the castor oil plant. It can be extracted from the waste materials, the mash or bean meal, left over from castor oil processing and turned into a powder, pellet or mist. What does it do and how bad is it? Ricin kills cells by shutting down their ribosomal RNA part of the molecular machine that builds their proteins. As the cells die, a ricin poisoning victim experiences different symptoms, depending on how they were exposed, usually starting within 6 to 12 hours. If ricin was inhaled, the victim is in for difficulty breathing, chest pains, coughing, nausea, a buildup of fluid in the lungs and respiratory failure. If the poison was ingested or injected, the victim can experience diarrhoea, bloody vomit and urine, seizures and failure of the kidneys, liver, spleen and or heart. Death from organ failure follows within 36 to 72 hours of exposure, according to the Centers for Disease Control. It doesn't take much of the stuff to wreak this kind of havoc either. The lethal dose for an adult is around 0.35 to 0.7 milligrams by inhalation, less than the mass of a single grain of sand, and between 1 and 20 milligrams per kilogram of body weight by ingestion. 1 milligram per kilogram is about what you'd ingest if you ate a small handful of castor beans. Yikes! How do you treat rice and poisoning? There's no known antidote for ricin, so the best treatment is flushing it out of the body as quickly as possible while maintaining organ function and treating individual symptoms. 
scary stuff. What is it good for besides terrorising politicians? Biomedical scientists have been experimenting with ricin as a cancer treatment for decades. The ricin protein is linked to an antibody to form an immunotoxin that attaches only to specific targeted cells. Once the immunotoxin latches onto a cancer cell, the ricin does its thing. Other than that though, ricin is mainly for murder and mayhem. Maybe the most famous ricin victim was Georgi Markov, murdered in a scheme that seems right out of a spy novel. In 1978, the Bulgarian writer was waiting for a bus when he felt a stinging pain in the back of his leg. When he looked behind him, he saw a man with an umbrella. The man crossed the street, got into a cab and fled. Three days later, Markov was dead. Murdered via a ricin-filled pellet injected into his leg by the modified umbrella. When making the Mysteries Abound podcast, I use a number of pieces of software. My music is stored in iTunes. I have created a playlist with 1,328 pieces of music from which I can choose. These then are dragged and dropped into Logic Pro X, which is the software which I use to create the podcast itself, the mixing of the sound and audio tracks. For Mysteries Abound, I use five tracks, which are then mixed at the end into one, and then converted to MP3. For the next article, it's probably worth you taking your time and visiting the show notes. It comes from the www.iwebstreet.com website, and is entitled... 10 Horrifying Ghost Photos and Their Stories. It's done in the format of a slideshow, and the photos, of course, are old and grainy and black and white and could be anything, really, but they're worth a look. And there's a red arrow to show you where the ghost is, just in case you're not sure. I thought I'd read the text. It's not very long. There's 10 slides. If you can't visit the show notes from the text... You can just use your imagination. The Brown Lady Taken at Rayham Hall, Norfolk, England in 1936, this paranormal photograph still remains unexplainable. The ghost-like image in the photograph is believed to be Dorothy Townsend, who, per reports, died in 1726 because of abuses on her from her husband. Ghosts Don't Call Shotgun Clicked in 1959, the photographer, after getting the role developed, found her deceased mother sitting in the rear seat of her car. She came to visit her mother's grave on that day. Group photo. Freddie Jackson, the face in the background, deceased two days before this group photograph was clicked due to an accident. The incident didn't stop him from showing up for the group photo though. Other group members confirmed the presence of the deceased in the group photo. Monk in the church. This is one of the most genuine and undeniably real pictures of ghosts ever taken. This was taken in the Church of England in summer 1954 by Reverend K.T. Ford. The picture features a monk-like ghost. 
And this one is certainly the classic ghost looking creature in the photograph. Mysterious Stranger Taken at Boot Hill Graveyard in Tombstone, Arizona in 1996, the man in the background wasn't there when the photograph was taken, claims the person who clicked it. Spirit in the Woods Clicked near Alice Springs, Australia in 1959, some of the experts did question this ghost photograph but it was explained that this could not be either double exposure or could not have been done with any photo to editing software. Stairway to the afterlife. The ghostly figure was only found once the photograph was developed. Taken at the National Museum in Greenwich, England, the photographer claimed that no one was present alongside the staircase or in the camera frame when he took the picture. The Fire Girl Taken in 1995, this is a picture from a burnt out building. The girl is believed to be Jane, who died in 1677 after starting an accidental fire. Well, while we believed it to be a real ghost, some called it a classic example of smoke creating illusion. The Lady of Bachelors Grove Taken at one of the world's most haunted graveyards, Bachelors Grove Cemetery, Illinois, people believe the woman in the photograph was not there at the time when it was clicked. However, a subject of debate, we believe a camera sometimes captures more than what the naked eye can see. Was that his favourite chair? This was taken by the photographer after the death of Lord Combermere in 1891. While family wanted some photographs clicked, the post-development results showed something astonishing. Lord Combermere's ghost seemed sitting on his favourite chair. Well, if you're interested, visit the show notes, take a look. They're not bad photographs. They could be photoshopped. They could be real. Who knows? The Mysteries Abound podcast, just like the Origins podcast, is a one-man show. I have a spare room in my house which I use as a sort of a studio, and I use my iMac and my podcaster microphone and my backup drives and the software purchased especially for the process. The whole thing cost about $3,000 and was a collection of things that were given to me for Christmas and birthdays. The podcast came out of an interest in something that I used to do when I was a full-time teacher. Now that I'm only doing casual work and are basically partly retired, I thought I'd follow up that interest and create a podcast that I would like to listen to. And I'm fortunate enough that other people like to listen to it as well. The shows have become reasonably popular over the years and I've generated quite a few online friendships as a result of them which I find very gratifying. From the www.grandhaventribune.com website, Legendary Dogman Seen in Ottawa County. And it's written by Kevin Collier. Several times in the past decade, West Michigan newspapers have reported on a strange canine-like creature people claim to have seen in the woodlands. Not the legendary Chupacabra, 
but the Michigan Dogman. Some eyewitnesses are convinced they have seen it, like one man who posted his opinion on an internet message board. If you also live anywhere north of Grand Rapids in Michigan, how can you not know about the Dogman? It is one of the largest legends in the area, and the story has been around for years, he wrote. It seems to me it is more than just a huge fantasy. The Dogman is reported to have a canine-like head, human-like body, reflective eyes and walks upright. According to one Ottawa County resident, a creature fitting the description of the Dogman appeared in Grand Haven from 1993 to 94. Ben, who was a young teenager at the time, claims to have seen the creature not once, but three times. He believes each time he was seeing a different creature, in what could have been a pack taking refuge in a Grand Haven Township park. In 1993 after dark, Ben was hiking the trails in Hoffman Nature Preserve with as many as four friends when, passing the float bridge near the centre of the preserve, they heard a sound to their right. Ben spied what resembled a dog standing behind a tree on a ridge above, approximately 70 feet away. I thought it was just a dog walking along. Then it stood up on its hind legs, Ben said. One of its feet gripped a branch on the tree. Our eyes met and we just stared at each other for about five minutes. Then it ran off. According to Ben, the second encounter occurred in December, that same year in the driveway of his family's home on Lakeshore Drive. Ben went outdoors in the cold to start his mother's car. I only made it as far as the front bumper of the car, he said. The creature then rose up from behind the vehicle. It stood up on its hind legs. It had yellow eyes, he explained. I'm six foot eight inches tall and it was staring down at me. I froze and began crying out. The creature took three incredible leaps and disappeared into the brush as Ben's family rushed out to the driveway. According to Ben, his third encounter with the creature took place in 1994 when he and a cousin were walking after dark in the direction of the beach from Lakeshore Drive, along the edges of the dunes. As the two watched a deer standing in a clearing, an enormous dog-like creature rapidly snatched the animal and carried it off into the brush. We went down to the spot, and you could see where the deer tracks ended, Ben said. They vanished leaving only tracks from that thing. There is also a tale that in early 1994, a car on Lakeshore Drive was involved in a collision with a large animal. It is said that the occupants of the vehicle were uninjured and police determined it was a deer strike. The tale includes a witness that claimed grey fur covered the grill of the wrecked vehicle, but no blood or animal carcass was found. It was said that the driver couldn't explain what he hit. As fantastic as the tales are, area folks have told similar stories for more than 50 years. One of merit is from Robert Fortney, who may have encountered the beast as he stood on the banks of the Muskegon River in 1938. It was reported that a large black dog reared up on its hind legs and stared at Fortney, who shot at the creature, which then fled. I wouldn't want to call it a dogman, he reportedly said, but relayed that he did not know what to call the canine that walked like a man. What may have pointed to as the best evidence supporting the existence of a dogman was the Gable film, a video transfer of what was claimed to be a mid-1970s home movie showing the creature. However, the film was proven to be fake in 2010. Even its creators admitted it was a hoax. Dogman in Grand Haven? It's hard to imagine, but at least it keeps the legend alive and barking. And from the creepypasta.com website. My grandfather knew why we run from the dark. And this story is credited to Anton Scheller.
I always admired my grandfather's courage. He had fought in the war on what we nowadays would think of as the wrong side. But he had never been a believer in the cause. Sometimes a rifle is pressed into your hand and your choice is either to fire and worry about being shot from the front, or not to fire and be sure that you'll be shot from behind. He was young when he was drafted, barely sixteen. Before he left he gave his first kiss and a promise to a girl. She waited five years until the end of the war, surviving on just five or six letters that she kept as treasure. The war ended, but even the defeat was celebrated, not openly, but in the hearts and eyes of the people. People never wage war. It is politicians that wage war. No soldier that ever stood in the line of a rifle believes that war is heroic. Only those divorced from reality, those that sit in tidy offices, those dream of war. Soldiers came home with thin bodies and bandaged limbs. They hugged their wives and women before they fell onto beds and relived the front in their dreams that made them toss and turn and wake up from their own screams. His girl watched with tears in her eyes while her sister and mother each welcomed their men home. She heard the men scream at night and each scream lodged a stone in her throat. She prayed that the man she kissed did not have to scream and then she prayed that the man she had kissed was alive enough to scream. Then she prayed for forgiveness for her selfishness. The other men, when they came, were often so thin that their women, when they welcomed them, were scared of hugging them too tightly, for their spines or ribs might break. Especially those that came from the east were thin, the skin of their faces sunken into their cheeks. Two years after the war, a scarecrow knocked on her door. An old man, forty at least, the arms thin like bare bones, a hard and dirty beard that had long stopped growing for want of nutrition, and his skin a grey with blue and black patches. His lips stretched into a black-toothed smile. She stepped back into the house. The door was closing fast. Wait, he said. It's me. Even after hot meal and shower and shave, she still recognised nothing except his eyes and the shape of his nose. It took two weeks before she thought that he was true, and another two before she was sure. Sometimes on those days when she took him along to the market, the sellers called him her father. The man in the leather chair had to ask her twice, and then demand another witness to make sure that he was the man he claimed to be, and not his father, or uncle, or another older relative. The war had stolen his youth. When my grandfather spoke about the war, he never spoke about his experiences. He spoke in the abstract. The way you speak about a movie or a book. Not even the way you speak about history. They were overrun. Hundreds of kilometres. There was no resistance at all. Then General Winter, as the Russians call it, attacked. The troops still got further. There were villages, poor people. It wasn't a choice. The supplies weren't coming. Everything was taken. All those that didn't run were shot. Sometimes he talked about the early phases of the war when everybody was hopeful, when things were going far too well and easy. He always said, not with pride, but in a matter-of-fact way, that the war would have been won if it had been against one or two or five countries, rather than against half the civilised world. But my grandfather refused to speak about the things that happened at the end and after the war. When he was asked, he didn't reply. He only shook his head and looked away. My grandmother said that she heard, heard strange things when he was asleep. She heard him begging for food or water, for a blanket. She heard him beg that someone stop. She heard him beg that someone let him go. She heard him beg for forgiveness. As long as I can remember, I asked my grandfather about the war. 
despite his warnings, for me those were stories of adventure and courage. I only heard when he spoke about trenches and gunfire, not when he spoke about catching rats for food or drying puddle water and trousers so soiled that it was better to rub them clean with mud and dry them in the rare moments of sun than to leave them as they were. I didn't understand that my questions hurt him, that I forced him to relive a time that he would have given an arm to forget. And yet, all those times when I made him tell me stories in his odd, unemotional and descriptive way, he refused to speak about the end. Once I baited him enough to say that he did not remember how he got home, sometimes riding on trains and sometimes by foot, but always just following the direction of the setting sun until he stumbled upon street signs that he could finally read. He came from far in the east, places he either did not remember or did not want to remember. And every time I asked his stories ended with the village that they pillaged, where they condemned men and women and children to death because they themselves did not know how else to survive. As said, I always admired my grandfather for his courage. He paid that war with his youth, and on his return decided that, for this heavy price, he at least wanted to be a good man. I could recount countless times when I saw him, an old man by then, chased down young rascals that had egged a house or stolen a handbag. He jumped in when neighbours needed help, he passed a burning house and thought he heard a child caught inside. He told me to stay where I was and without a thought slammed his shoulder into the door until it broke from his hinges and he himself disappeared in black smoke. In the end there was no child that needed to be saved. My mother called him a fool for breaking his shoulder like that. For me, he was a hero. My grandfather taught me that we all dream of being courageous but that very few of us take our chance to be a hero when it is offered to us. In our lives we pass countless times where we could save, but we drive past and look for excuses. I have to hurry home. It didn't look that bad. Others were already helping. Being scared and comfortable is easier than being courageous, and to make ourselves feel good, we imagine heroic acts we could have done if we had the time, or if it had been that bad, or if others hadn't been there. There was only one thing my grandfather was scared of. Dark rooms. Their house had a basement, but they rarely if ever used it. There were strong lights installed, and the light switch was outside the basement door but there was nothing inside except for old furniture, never to be used again, and a few old tyres that should some day have made a swing. My grandmother did not mind entering the basement, but he forbade her to use it. There are things, he said, that live in such darkness. At night he made sure that everyone else was upstairs and in their rooms. He turned the flashlight on and the living room lights off and faster than he should have moved in his age, hastened up the stairs. The guest room was right next to their bedroom. So many times in years I heard him run up those stairs, slam the door, and breathe heavy air into his lungs. My grandmother never complained. She never told him that he had to stop or that he was risking his life. She understood. She knew. He had told her. My father's parents had died in a car accident when I was young. For me, they are a hazy memory, more photos than people. That might be why my mother's parents were so important for me. They were my personal grandparents, the ones I had and the ones I loved. They had always been very healthy. When I was young, my grandfather still ran and played soccer with me. But in the last few years, their age was beginning to take its toll. I noticed they had lost their ability to focus, their ability to remember recent events, then their ability to remember me. My grandmother and grandfather still followed their routine. They cared for themselves and didn't need our help except for tax matters and other administrative duties that some government official had decided needed to be complicated. 
My parents visited often to make sure that the house was in order and food in the fridge. They kept me updated on my grandparents' health and happiness. For Christmas, I finally managed to visit. It's not a nice thing to admit, but my parents and I, with my mother as her parents' only child and me as my parents' only child, made sure to be there and not have any other plans because we thought it might be the last Christmas that we would have together as a family. I was happy to see them and hug them again. I felt guilty in a way that I hadn't provided any great-grandchildren yet and had not even a girlfriend or a wife to present. I was surprised how confused they were, that they did not remember who I was. My grandparents did not seem to remember my parents' names either, but they still recognised their faces. I was a stranger, face and name alike, and during the meals and songs and conversations I felt as if I was an intruder in bygone lives that they were living with glassy eyes. It was the 26th of December. My parents and grandmother went to see the Christmas market. I stayed home with my grandfather and his aching knee to drink tea and play Scrabble. I was in the kitchen when he called out. Son? With the teapot I walked back into the living room. He sat in his armchair, upright, his eyes suddenly clear and right on me. Son? He said again loud and forceful. Yes. Make sure the lights are on. Sure, Grandpa. I walked towards the light switch. His eyes followed me. They come when the lights are off, he said. You know that, right? I'm not sure who comes, but I'll keep the lights on for you. They. His voice was not frail anymore. It thundered through the room. They come. Those things. I told you about them. I turned the light on. I don't think you told me, I said. I'm not sure what you mean. Don't fool me, boy. I'm really sorry. I really don't know what you mean. Oh, I told you. I know I told you. I taught you to keep the lights on. You told me to keep the lights on, but you never told me why. There was anger in his face. Why? Why? I saw them, and I saw what they do to us, and you doubt me? You saw things in the dark. Three years I saw them. Three years they held me and the others. I never heard about that. Oh, he said, then you should. That evening, in less than 20 minutes, my grandfather told me about his last years at the front. One year before the war ended, they were ordered to retreat. They fled in small groups through the countryside they had pillaged and burnt just weeks before past houses with the frozen dead still inside. There was a church, he said, a large old church made of stone. It was the only building still intact in the village, the only place to seek shelter from the wind and cold. They made a fire with old church benches and sank to their sleep right next to it. Seven men in total, two injured and moaning, and the other five just scared and weak. My grandfather said he woke up from screams all around him. The room was pitch black. The stone floor was moving under his body. He struggled to get to his feet, only then realised that his feet were being held. The floor was still. His feet were being pulled. And then he too screamed. He said they were pulled downstairs. His weapon and knife were gone. Then he heard more people moaning and screaming. A suffocating stench punched into his lungs. He was thrown onto a heap of warm bodies. Something bit his leg and he kicked and a man screamed in pain. The room was pitch black. Another man was thrown on him. A door fell shut and was locked. He said they moved away from the heap of bodies, but the cold soon drove them to get closer. Every few minutes somebody screamed. He could hear flesh ripping and teeth grinding. He said there must have been hundreds of people. He said they tried to hammer against the metal door and scream for help, and the voice of an old man laughed at them from behind. He said in broken German that the door was thick and nobody there that could hear them. 
But once every while the door opened, something dark moved inside. And when it came inside, the room grew cold and the humans moved closer to one another. My grandfather said that he felt the energy being drained from his body and a panic and dread rise in his soul. Soon the dread started, even before the door opened. They all adapted. There was no problem with water. It ran occasionally down the walls, and if it was not licked off, it accumulated on the floor to join with the layers of excrement and sweat. He said that he tried to hold on, but that after days of hunger, you choose desperate measures. He said that he never killed one there, that he only took pieces from those that had died, or at least those that he thought had died. Every few days, more were thrown into the room, Every few days there was a struggle, some of the old against some of the new. They tried to stay together, the brothers in arms that had fought together, but soon that too broke apart. He said that some day the number of new people started decreasing. There were only a rare few, and the numbers in the room dwindled. He sat for most of the time on a higher stone, one that the others seemed to have not found. He only climbed down when he knew that a struggle had ended, that one was dead, that something could be eaten. But no matter the struggles, every time when the dread came and the door opened, they all huddled together. They all felt the same exhaustion and cold and panic in their souls. And then one day, long after no more new people arrived, when only three or four or five were left. There were footsteps outside. He was scared because he didn't feel dread. The door opened and a man with a torch stood there. A gun fell from his hand and his mouth opened and he ran and scrambled up the stairs and he threw up while running. The door was open. There was a glimmer of light from upstairs. That was how my grandfather left. He said he didn't turn to look who or what he left behind. Something behind him scrambled up the stairs too, but he was the first to get out and he was the first to reach the forest and eat grass and bugs and other things that he found close to the ground. He found a piece of cloth first, then a rotten uniform on a corpse, and later, when he had scrambled far enough and when his strength returned, He found a village and stole a dry uniform from a laundry line and a bag of potatoes from the same place. I don't know what they are, he said, but they live from the warmth and spirit we leave behind. I nodded. They live off us, he said. Do you understand? They need you to exist. They want to catch you. They want to drain you. They want you to forget about light. The light, I asked? Yes, he said, the light. They held us in the darkness. Three years they drained me and lived off me and made me do things I don't even want to think again. He cleared his throat. And he said, I know what that dread feels like. It's not like any other. It is at the core of your being and you feel it in your spine and back and gut. Three years I felt it and after that it never went away. It never went away? Of course it didn't, he said, because they always stay, they always wait, they will always be there, consuming what spirit you leave behind and hoping that one day you become careless, that you forget about the light, and then they strike. I glimpsed outside where the world was slowly turning grey. They are here? Right now? My grandfather nodded. They wait, he said. They come and consume what we leave. But they hope for more. They hope that one of us grows careless and ignores the dread. They wait until one of us stays when the room is dark. We sat quietly, his eyes meeting mine. Okay, I finally said. Good, he said. He nodded silently, then looked outside. A moment later, his eyes seemed glassy again. Are you okay, I asked. He turned to me and frowned. Who are you? he asked. It was the last conversation that I truly had with him. Since January his condition got worse. He talked about dead men. He spoke about hunger and fear. 
He asked for the girl that he had kissed when he was sixteen, and neither he nor she noticed that the girl sat right next to him, patting his hand. I loved my grandfather. I miss him. I wish I had been there rather than a six-hour drive away, and that I could have taken care of him rather than leave him alone. I wish that it had been me or my parents and not the girl that waited seven years for his return that had to find him. But most of all, and I know that that sounds cruel and wrong and selfish, I wish that he would have died in his bed or in the hospital during the day. I wish so much that she didn't have to find him in the morning, on the living room floor, with the flashlight off and his mouth wide open. The music for today's podcast came from the musicalley.com website. The bandwidth is provided by TalkShoe at www.talkshoe.com. The show notes are kept at the Origins podcast website, www.origins.info. And remember, Origins is spelled O-R-I-G-I-N-Z. And we also have a Facebook page, www.facebook.com forward slash Paul Rexy, and here you'll find all about podcast updates, when shows are being released, and all that sort of stuff. And if you're wondering why I was giving you some background information about the podcast today, the reason is that I'm doing a little bit of a fundraising drive for the podcast. I need to replace one of my pieces of equipment. My 2006 laptop has just about had it, and this is the one that I use to research the podcasts on and collect information, especially when I'm away from home, like I did on my last trip to see the granddaughter in Canberra. It needs to be replaced. The letter Z doesn't work, and the poor old batteries had it, and basically the computer's seeing better days. And because I'm on a very limited income now, because I don't work full time, I tend to rely on donations when they come in. So if you're able to give a donation to the podcast, it would be greatly appreciated. And there are a couple of links on the show notes page. And I'd just like to say thank you to these people who have contributed a donation since the link was put back up on the website. So it's a big thank you to Glenn Larson, Paul Reynolds, Evan Moyle, Finn Christensen, Mitch Driver, Brian Vitunik, Brian Bigler, Hilary here, Paul Hutchthausen, Robert Kraske, Aidan Brosnan, Christina Condor, The Twin Cities Fantasy Factory, Ken and Kathleen Nagorski, James Hess, Gabriel De Maria, Hilary Hook, Steve Werner, Sean Yarnell, Darren Ludlam, Robert Flood, Samantha Coons, Kevin McLeod, and Andy King. Big thank you, everyone. Your help is truly and greatly appreciated. And remember, if you can help the podcast out in any small way, your help will be greatly appreciated also. So until next time, whether it be Origins or Mysteries Abound, this is Paul saying bye for now. Keep well, everyone, and thank you for your ongoing support.